Steve is uh, an Olympus ambassador, but he's uh, best known really uh, for being a, uh, a landscape photographer. And um, Steve does shoot it in color, but um, I think he's best known for his black and white. And uh, he's, he, he, he's got quite a challenge really, because a, a lot of people, a lot of the Olympus naysayers say you can't do um, landscape on micro four thirds. And I think that Steve is going to prove to us uh, quite convincingly that that's rubbish. Um, so um, anyway, uh, Steve, I'd like to um, say hello. Thank you very much. Hopefully you can see me now. Not too scary. I'm sorry you've got my, the clutter of my office behind me, but the last time I tried to put an image behind me or a green screen, sort of bits of my head, which is already a little funny shape, kept disappearing into the background. It made me look a bit like Voldemort. So I decided the untidy nature of my office was better than seeing my head coming and going. So I think mine's doing that right now, but Okay. <laughs> well, th thanks for the introduction. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill my video um, and uh, share my screen. And I will start showing you some images and I will start the, the talk. And then once I finish the talk, I will turn my video back on. So, um, you know, if, that, if you find that a little scary, you can look away now, as they say on the TV. Um, so, okay, I'll share my screen and we'll hope that this works. And hopefully, you will see an image and a different image. Is that all working okay? It is indeed, yes. Fantastic. That's good. Right. I can start in th with the comfort of knowing I'm not talking to myself. I used to do these a few years ago for um, uh, Gitso. And the software they used, you couldn't communicate with the with the moderator during the talk. So I used to worry that I could spend... 45 minutes talking to myself so um, at least this way you can interrupt me if things go awry on the technology front anyway enough of all that thank you very much um, to all of you for signing up for today's presentation and thank you to Ian for inviting me uh, to join you in this session I'm going to talk to you about my approach to photography what I hope I'll do is provide some insight to my philosophy, my beliefs and the principles that underpin my work. As I do that, I'm going to share with you some quotes from other photographers. Uh, my reason for doing that is twofold. Firstly, uh, I feel that the quotes more eloquently describe what I want to say in a far more effective way than perhaps I could. And secondly, it's reassuring for me to know that even if you think what I'm saying is a little weird, then at least I can claim the legitimacy of not being the only person with this point of view. So it's a bit of a comfort blanket for me, really. As I go through, I'll show you some images, examples of my landscape and travel photographs. And as uh, Ian has said, they are all going to be black and white in this presentation. I do occasionally shoot colour. A friend of mine many years ago said to me that when I grow up, I will learn to colour my photographs in, but I'm afraid I still primarily shoot in black and white, as you will see and hear. Um, given the nature of this group, I'm sure you will be pleased to hear that they were all taken with Olympus cameras, um, OMDs, Pen Fs, um, even a tough TG4, I think it was. Um, this photograph was taken on my 2016 trip to South Georgia and Antarctica with one of my favorite camera and lens combinations, the EM1 Mark II and the 12 to 100 mil Pro Zoom. Uh, this image was also taken with that lens and that camera demonstrating what a flexible optic I think it is. I mean, it's great for general landscapes, travel, and uh, close-up work, I guess not true macro, but close-up work like this. If I was forced to choose just one lens, uh, somebody asked me this on a webinar the other night, what would that lens be? It would be this 12 to 100 mil Pro. Anyway, coming back, enough of kit for now. We'll come back to that sometime. Um, but coming back to my presentation, I will leave some time at the end for questions. So as I'm talking, um, please um, type in your questions and we'll deal with as many of those as we can at the end of the presentation. Okay, so my approach to uh, landscape photography. 
Um, my prime aim, just first point, my prime aim with my photography is to communicate what I feel as much, if not more than simply what I see. So when I'm looking at a subject or a scene, I'm often trying to consider um, not only what it is that's appealing to me visually and how can I make an interesting composition out of it, I'm also assessing how do I feel? Is the landscape generating an emotional response in me? And how do I best communicate that? Uh, Don McCullin, British photographer, I'm sure you all know, best known for his uh, documentary uh, images, has said, photography for me is not looking, it's feeling. If you can't feel what you're looking at, then you're never going to get others to feel anything when they look at your pictures. So I believe that the most powerful images are the ones where we feel passionately about the subject matter. I know if, if I'm not stirred, so when I'm looking at a scene in front of me, if I'm not stirred by what's in front of my camera, there's a good chance that the images, although I would hope uh, well composed and exposed correctly and so on, will almost certainly lack impact. Uh, many years ago, I was um, photographing uh, plants and flowers quite a lot. And um, gar some garden magazines commissioned me to photograph gardens. Now, I don't want to cause offence to anybody here, but I really don't enjoy gardening. I do it. I have to. I have a garden, but I don't particularly enjoy the process of gardening. Uh, I have no sort of connection with it at all. And what I found was that you know, I happily photographed gardens. Uh, they were paying me after all. Um, and the photographs, when I looked at them, I think were well composed, exposed, sharp, da 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 da. The magazines were certainly happy with them. They paid me and they commissioned me to do more work but after one summer of doing it I decided it just wasn't for me because I, I had no emotional connection with what I was photographing it just left me cold uh, it became a technical exercise rather than some communication of a of an idea um, or of some mood or some passion about the the subject um, which brings me to a quote by American photographer Ruth Bernhard who said if you are not passionately devoted to an idea you can make very pleasant pictures but they won't make you cry and Eugene Smith said this is one of my favorite quotes uh, Eugene Smith um, said that uh, what is the use of adequate depth of field without adequate depth of feeling which brings me to my second point i'm not interested in technical perfection for its own sake i'd much rather have a slightly soft image that has mood and atmosphere than a technically technically perfect photograph that fails to convey any emotion uh, I know this is probably sacrilege to say what I'm about to say as a landscape photographer, but um, if you gave me the choice between having an Ansel Adams print on my wall or a Susan Bernstein print, and I'll talk more about her in a second, um, I'd go for the Susan Bernstein print. I've seen Ansel Adams prints. They're amazing. Technically, absolutely fantastic. Um, incredible to, to see the real prints. Um, but they just left me a little bit cold. Whereas Susan Bernstein, she shoots with toy cameras. She makes her own cameras out of rubber bands, super glue, magnifying glasses. Her images are um, soft, they're vignetted, um, but boy, do they contain and communicate mood and emotion. They're really, really powerful images. If you're not aware of her work, look her up. Susan Bernstein and the Bernstein spelled B U R N. S T I N E. So, in this context, I want to read you a quote from Freeman Patterson uh, in his book Photo Impressionism and the Subjective Image. And I believe it's a quote worth sharing in full. It very accurately reflects my approach. He said, The great tradition of still photography is documentation, the representation of objective reality. There is, however, a second tradition, that of altering physical reality for the purpose of expressing the photographer's personal response to a specific subject matter 
or to a concept or idea. The impressionist photographer deliberately abandons physical exactitude in the belief that by doing so, he or she can convey more effectively the reality of feeling. So many of the images that I take, to use Freeman Patterson's words, abandon physical exactitude. They are not an accurate representation of what was there. So, for example, as we've already noted, I produce primarily black and white images. So they're already one step away from reality. And as such, they can never be a record shot. Um, I think there is some rare medical condition where people only see the world in black and white, but it is incredibly, incredibly rare. Most people see the world in colour, so my images are not an accurate portrayal of what is in front of us. Guy Tal, an American photographer uh, and an interesting writer on photography, was writing in Lenswork magazine, and he said, the aim of art is not literal transcription, but rather to offer useful metaphors. Aesthetic experiences are suing out of sensory perceptions. In this sense, color photography may be at somewhat of a disadvantage, as our default state is to see and perceive the world in color. He went on to say, black and white, in contrast, starts off with an inherent and generally acceptable degree of departure from reality. And it's interesting, I find that I can process a black and white image uh, and it looks nothing like the scene in front of me, but captures my emotional response to it. And people don't bat an eyelid. Whereas I can show a color image that I've done very little to, and people will claim that I've done it all in Photoshop. And it may be just because I've got out of bed at dawn and photographed a mountain lit with pink and orange uh, light. Um, so it's interesting. You can get away with more in the world of black and white, I think. But sometimes I'll go further than just producing a monochrome image in my alteration of physical reality. So, for example, I'll use neutral density filters to extend the exposure into several seconds or minutes. The resulting photographs are not what the eye sees, but for me, they best capture the dynamic, restless and powerful nature of the landscape as I often feel it. So, for example, this photograph was taken in the Faroe Islands. Um, it shows the rock stack known as the Witch's Finger in Faroese. I think that's Troll Colin Finger, um, which has been shaped and sculpted by the wind and the sea. And I wanted to capture that sense of those elements shaping the rocks in front of me. And for a project that I worked on back in 2018, um, which I have a, a book available called The Forgotten, uh, it, I used an infrared converted OMD camera because the resulting effect suited the subject matter and the mood that I was looking to recreate. Also, shooting in infrared light, um, shooting infrared light created a tonal separation between the graves and the surrounding foliage. I'd previously tried to shoot it as a standard black and white image, but uh, everything became a sort of shade of mid grey. It just didn't work very well. Here's another photograph from the same project. And I spent a few months returning to this Victorian graveyard that has become overgrown nature is starting to reclaim the space. The graves are now neglected and the once wealthy and influential people that are buried there have long been forgotten, hence the, the title of the project. I'm also a great fan of pinhole photography. Uh, I started many years ago using a handmade wooden and brass pinhole camera, but this photograph was taken with a pinhole body cap, uh, an adapter on an Olympus OMD body. And the advantages of using a mirrorless camera for pinhole photography rather than a DSLR is that the adapter can be recessed into the body. So the adapter can be made to be a concave shape, which gives a wider angle of view as the focal length is determined by the distance measured from the pinhole to the sensor. And one of the things I got used to with film pinhole photography is traditionally you get a very wide angle of view, about a sort of 18 mil, I guess, angle of view. Or I'll distort my images in other ways. Now, the filter used for this particular shot 
cost me around uh, 24,000 pounds. Before you all start running out to Wex and placing your orders, I have to confess that the filter in question was the wet windscreen of my car. Um, this was taken as a part of a series of images that I worked on in the style of artist Norman Aykroyd. Uh, some of you may know his work, but he's produced amazing etchings of the Scottish landscape. And so when I took this, the rain was falling heavily, the light was rapidly failing. So I pulled up at the side of a lock, waited for the rain to coat my windscreen, and then took a few photographs in the gloom. And this is one of them. Here's another from the same series taken again in Scotland at Loch Tulla. Uh, these images could only have been taken on an Olympus camera as they require a particular mix of using one of the built-in art filters, the dramatic tone filter, and a high ISO. And what happens is that the um, noise processing in the camera smudges the details. And, um, and so if you're shooting at ISO 3200 or 6400, you get these very impressionistic results with the, uh, with the tone, dramatic tone filter. So I'm sure it'll come as no surprise to hear that I'm not very interested in documentary photography. Uh, I don't want to sound pretentious here, but I'm interested in photography as an art form as a way of communicating mood and emotion and atmosphere. And in this context, I'd like to share with you a, another quote, this time from Professor Ramachandran's 2003 BBC Reith Lecture, The Artful Brain. And this, um, if you were wondering about the title of the talk, this is where the title comes from. He said, art has nothing to do with realism. It's not about creating a realistic replica of what's out there in the world. In fact, art is about the exact opposite. It's about deliberate hyperbole, exaggeration, in fact, even distortion in order to create pleasing effects in the brain. And another quote that links to my next point comes from Brooks Jensen. He's the editor of uh, Lenswork magazine. And um, he's, uh, he's written a few books, and I will quote from, from some of them, but this particular book is called Letting Go of the Camera. And um, it's a great book. It doesn't cost a lot, probably about £15 pounds an hour, I would think, paperback book. No photographs in it, just his thoughts and musings on the process of photography, but a very interesting book, uh, a worthwhile read. And what he said was, not every picture needs to be tack sharp. Not every picture needs to have smooth tones. Not every picture needs to be absolutely grainless. In fact, what is important is not detail in the image, but detail in the sentiment. This photograph you see in front of you was taken with a Pen F with a 17mm f1.8 lens handheld in New York at ISO 6400. It's got um, you know, a gritty sort of grainy texture that you might expect shooting at ISO 6400 but uh, converted to black and white it gives it a, a sort of a, a grainy type texture that I think suits the, the mood of the image. So I believe this, this notion as, as uh, Jensen called it of detail in the sentiment to be an essential underpinning of all successful photography because my third point is that photography is about communication. So before I release the shutter, I like to consider what is the thought, idea, concept or emotion that I'm trying to communicate to the viewer of my photograph. So the question, why am I taking this photograph, underpins all of the subsequent decisions that I make about composition, lens choice, aperture selection, which filters I use, all the way through to how I process the image. Um, I have to say, when I first started working in this way, it was quite a conscious and deliberate process. But I found that ultimately, if you practice it often enough, it ultimately it becomes second nature. It's a bit like driving a car. Um, you know, you get in and, and hopefully <laughs> you don't have to think about which one's the accelerator, which one's the brake, which one's the clutch. You don't go through mirror signal maneuver every time you get into the, into the car. It just happens. And, and this process of, you know, why am I taking this photograph? Often um, 
just happens in the background and I only become conscious of it if somebody perhaps on a workshop says to me how are you seeing this particular scene or they see an image of mine and they ask so you know what were you trying to convey with that particular photograph um, it's it happens subconsciously David Gibson UK based street photographer says in his book the street photographers manual doing things deliberately with a clear understanding of our motives always makes for stronger or at least more interesting work so i believe if i press the shutter without some clarity about what i'm trying to communicate it's akin to starting a sentence before knowing what i want to say it's like picking up a pen and writing random words on the page without really knowing what it is i'm trying to communicate to the reader if i don't know what the purpose is in taking the image then it boils down to sheer luck as to what story, if any, my photographs tell. American photographer Gordon Park said, those people who want to use a camera should have something in mind, something they want to show, something they want to say. This photograph was taken in Antarctica at a fantastic place called Portal Point, And we got off the ship onto the Zodiacs, landed on the beach and arrived in this location and I was overwhelmed by the wall of snow and ice but it was really hard to get a sense of scale when I was first looking at it really difficult to get a, a sense of how large or small this wall might be uh, I don't usually include people in my photographs but I felt that here the two figures dwarfed by the landscape were an essential essential element in the composition in conveying what I was trying to communicate with this particular photograph and the theme of communication was echoed by Eddie Ephraims in an article titled the language of the black and white print which was published a few years ago now in the UK's black and white photography magazine and he said as with learning any language being able to speak it is one thing Knowing what we want to say with it, how, and to whom, is another. As a workshop instructor or as a tutor running one-to-ones, I can say from experience, the hardest people to teach are those who don't know what they want to say with their camera. People have got lots of things to say, but don't know how to convert that into photographic technique. Um, you know, that, they're the people that are relatively easy to teach. It's the people that have no idea, you know, to use my analogy against like picking up a pen and not knowing what you want to write. Or the other analogy I use, it's, um, you know, sometimes I feel like uh, J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books, and someone goes up to her and asks her, says, you know, I want to write a novel. Will you give me some help? And she says, yeah, what do you want to write a novel about? And their answer is, well, I don't know. What do you think I should write a novel about? And that's sometimes how I feel on a workshop. Because I can't really tell anyone what to photograph. I can help them with the how. Um, this is a photograph, obviously, of um, the Campanile and uh, Piazza San Marco in Venice. Um, I was there, not when I took this particular photograph, but I was there um, a few years ago running a workshop. We'd been there four or five days already, and I had a lady with me in St. Mark's Square. And I think, you know, by her own admission, she would say that if there's a continuum from beginner through to experienced photographer, she was very much at the beginner end of that. And uh, she came up to me and she said, um, what should I photograph? And I went into nonchalant teenager mode and said, I don't know, what do you want to photograph? <laughs> and she looked at me and said, you're not being very helpful. And I said, no, deliberately so. Because if I tell you what to photograph, who's going to tell you what to photograph next week or next month or next year? I'm not going to be with you. You've got to find a way of coming up with your own response to the location. And what I suggested to her was put the camera away, wander around for top five or 10 minutes and ask yourself the question, if I had to describe this place to somebody who wasn't here today with me in one, two or three words, what would they be? And to give her a due, she came up with her three words. Uh, it didn't have to be three. One would have done, but she came up with three words. Some people struggle to do that. And the words were big, busy and people. 
And so I was then able to talk her through the photographic options to communicate that. What she did in the end was she got the camera low to the floor uh, on a tripod, wide angle lens, neutral density filter to give a long exposure. The wide angle lens gave her the sense of scale, so it gave her the big. Um, and the long exposure gave her people some, you know, very blurred passing in front of the camera, some um, blurred as they walked through, hesitated and walked on. Some were sharp. They were stood talking to, to their friends or looking at their phones or whatever. Uh, but in that way, she came up with big, busy and people. It was her response to St. Mark's Square. It wasn't my response. It wasn't my photograph. It was one that was unique to her. So by considering in these situations what our one, two or three words would be to describe our chosen subject to someone who hasn't seen the subject or been to the location, we're then able to develop our own unique response to the world in front of us. From there, we can develop our own vision, our personal way of seeing the world, and from that evolves our photographic style. Importantly, the process starts with an idea. Another quote from Brooks Jensen, uh, photographs, at least good ones, are always about ideas. Without ideas, photographs are merely images. For an image to be idealist is as emasculating as a paragraph without a thought. Now, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with his distinction between um, photographs and images. I think that's a bit pedantic, but I do agree with the, the second part of that quote, for an image to be idealist is as emasculating as a paragraph without a thought. And in another quote, he demonstrates the interconnected nature of what I've been saying. The pianist, he said, who plays notes without feeling, is not an artist. Neither is the photographer who presents zone and tone without passion. Passion is emotion, involvement, connection, and these are the result of an idea. Let that idea, he said, be the beginning of your creative efforts. This is a photograph of local woods close to my home, and I've spent over the last uh, 11 years, I've spent many happy hours there walking my dog. It's a location I feel very connected to. Being there in the stillness of early morning is a, is a very spiritual experience. If my sons could hear me say this, they'd be talking about me being a tree hugger, but that's by the by. Um, one misty morning when I took this photograph, I looked back down the path that I just walked up towards the light and this scene just lifted my mood it reminded me of how regenerating nature can be for the soul and something I've been strongly reminded of over these last few weeks while we've been in lockdown uh, I hope this photo communicates at least a little bit of that feeling This photograph was taken on a three-day stay in Singapore. It's a great city. I enjoyed the stay there. But as someone who prefers open spaces, I have to say I found it claustrophobic. The humidity was incredibly oppressive and the concrete structures overwhelming. Uh, I was glad we were only there for a short stay. This photograph of a distant skyscraper framed between the two huge roads overhead captured the feeling of suffocation and confinement that I was feeling at the time. And the cloud, which I waited to move into place, the cloud offered some small positive connection with the natural world beyond. My fourth point is that I take photographs for me. At the time of pressing the shutter, I give no thought or have no concern as to whether somebody else might like the photographs or not. Don't want that to, to sound arrogant. I, you know, there's a, there, it's not arrogance. It's just about um, focusing on what is important to me and the way I want to portray it, as I'm about to go on and say. So I'm not trying to please an audience, real or imagined. I'm taking photographs simply to please me. George Barr, in his book, My Photographs Work, which is an interesting uh, book to get hold of, he said, um, attempts to create an image to please others will usually fail. The image can seem trite or simply lack the spark that signifies great photography. You can, however, produce an image that means something to yourself and let the viewer have his or her own reaction. 
I get a, a lot of photographers from camera clubs coming on my workshops and I see that many of them are driven by the need to take photographs that they feel will do well in club competitions. They're worried that a judge might not like what they produce. So I, you know, I have conversation with people. Well, that's an interesting image. Why don't you take it? Well, yeah, I like it, but the judges at the club will only score it nine out of 20. Um, my view on that is who cares? If you like it, take it. The constraint of trying to please others means that we're not photographing what we want in the way that we want to shoot it, but we're constantly trying to second guess the reaction of our audience. But when we become overly concerned with whether people might like our photographs or not, this restricts our vision. It limits our creativity and it hampers the development of our own unique approach. Robert Adams in his book Beauty in Photography says, making photographs has to be a personal matter. When it's not, the results are not persuasive. And it's not just camera club members who become obsessed with trying to please others. I've read many over many years in photographic magazines. Normally every year they do a sort of making money out of your camera uh, feature. And what they argue is that um, if you want to sell your images, you should analyze what the market wants and take photographs that you know will sell, that will meet those needs. I have to say, after 30 plus years of selling photographs, I still don't know for sure when I fire the shutter whether a photograph's going to sell or not. And yet, I still read advice given to freelancers that they should shoot what the market wants. Now, I used to worry about this. You know, why is my experience uh, so different to, um, to the advice that I was reading? Until a few years ago, I came across an article, I think it was on the Lexar card, you know, the card makers on their website. It was an article by a specialist photo marketing consultant. And she argued that photographers who worry about the, uh, the market, about, you know, what's going to sell, lack confidence in their own photographic vision. Her advice was, take what you like and then find a market so then find your if you're not looking to sell your images find your audience um and i picked up a great quote from her that appeals to my sense of humor um she said here's an open secret for every possible photographic vision there is a market i don't care she said if you shoot cross-processed insect porn somewhere there's a market for it I have to say I've never tried to shoot cross-processed insect porn, but perhaps if I get fed up with landscape photography, that might be the, the next market to tackle. I'm only joking. Um, most of my work, as I've said before, is, uh, is black and white, but I know from personal experience that black and white photography is not universally popular. Um, a few years ago, many years ago now, I had an exhibition of my pinhole photographs, uh, black and white images, at Joe Cornish's gallery. My mum, who lived in Manchester, I live in North Yorkshire, um, was interested in coming over and seeing this exhibition, not least because she, she likes Joe's work. Um, and uh, she came, stayed for the week, and one day I took her up to the gallery. We got to the gallery uh, we walked into the room where my prints were hanging on display. She walked through the door, took a cursory look around the room and walked out. And I said to her, that's it, is it? And she said, yeah, it's black and white. And I don't like black and white. So um, we spent the rest of the time looking at Joe's images, which was great, but not what we went there to do. Not that I'm bitter about that, of course. <laughs> um, in an interview in Lenswork magazine, uh, Clyde Butcher, an American photographer who lives in Florida, talked about his decision in 1986 to stop shooting color and concentrate solely on black and white photography and how everyone thought he was crazy. And in this interview, he says, well, I was in a way when I was photographing in color, I would photograph something I knew would sell. When I was photographing in black and white, I photographed what I thought was important about Florida what was interesting about Florida. And I didn't worry about what would sell because I knew it wouldn't sell. Unfortunately, it sold. 
I strongly believe that we must give ourselves permission to develop our own style and vision unconstrained by the pressure to please someone else. To be constantly worrying about pleasing others can result in our photographs staying safe and acceptable. Our images then end up as clones of photographs that the world seen before, which, to be honest, is just so very boring. Um, another quote from Brooks Jensen. This is from another one of his books called Single Exposures. He said, being true to your heart is the only way to make really interesting and significant artwork. There is almost no correlation between popularity and creativity. The important correlation is between creativity and passion. So be true to yourself. This photograph is a much photographed tree at Lake Monica in New Zealand on the South Island. Uh, it's become a cliche. Um, so much so that professional photographer friends of mine refuse to photograph it and have made fun of me because I did. Do I care? No. I didn't consciously copy anyone else's shot of this location. I was not influenced by anyone else and unconcerned about other people's reactions. My sole aim was to record my response to the subject on the day I was there, to capture the feeling of isolation, peace tranquility that I felt that day looking across the lake as the gentle rain fell. We have no control over the reaction of a viewer to our images. They bring to the viewing experience their life history, their experiences, their photographic or artistic knowledge, their current mood and feelings. You know, have they had an argument with the kids um, the morning before they went to work? Are they in the process of a messy divorce? Are they under the threat of being made redundant? All of those things will influence their mood and their interaction with our images. We have no control over them. They are completely out of our control. So ultimately, for that reason, I shoot for me what I want to photograph in the way that I see it. And my favorite quote on this comes from French photographer jean Lucif. He said, I make photographs for me. If other people like them, that's just too bad. Okay, I want to show you some examples, more examples of my work, but talk specifically uh, about them in more detail to describe the motivations, the thoughts and the ideas behind specific images. And hopefully that process will help in demonstrating how I implement the principles and the approach that I've just spent uh, the last uh, 40, 35 minutes or so describing. This photograph is of Castle Stalker in Scotland. And there's something about Scottish castles that makes me think of Dracula films. Uh, whoever designed them did a really good job in putting off any uh, potential invaders because I think in the right weather conditions, evil and malicious intent just seems to ooze from their walls. On this day, the lighting was perfect, a little bit overcast, the sky was cooperating, these fantastic moody looking clouds. And so I searched hard for a composition that reflected the mood of Dracula's castle. When I found this large rock, and then discovered the gargoyle-like face, so two eyes and a nose and a gaping mouth, um, I knew I had my photograph, a visual and metaphorical connection between the foreground and the background. This photograph was taken at a place called Wilhelmina Bay in Antarctica uh, before breakfast. Early one morning, probably about four in the morning, the captain of our ship had run the bow onto the ice, onto the sea ice. So we walked straight down the ramp from the ship into this magical landscape. It was a minimalist photographer's dream, a world of white surrounded by rugged snow-covered peaks interspersed with small revealing patches of rock. On leaving the ship, I spotted the relationship between the shape of the bow here whoops, uh, here, and the shape of the mountain behind, which um, looked like an upturned ship to me. So there was a graphical connection between these two elements. And so I, um, I framed the shot. I deliberately kept this little white slash in on the side uh, to break up what was potentially a large dark area. Uh, but I particularly liked the simplicity 
of the of the composition because I tend to agree with Michael Kenner when he says in an interview in George Barr's book I referred to before I am drawn to suggestion rather than description details do not greatly interest me and Ernst Haas Austrian photographer who spent a lot of his life in the US who said the less information the more illusion the less prose the more poetry for I generally take a reductionist approach to composition, taking elements out of the frame rather than adding more in. My usual question when I'm looking through the viewfinder is, how much more can I take out of the frame and still retain the essence of what I'm trying to communicate about my subject? So this photograph, taken in a fairly typical day on the Isle of Skye, pouring down with rain, um, and it's fairly typical of my style, keeping the details and the number of elements within it to a minimum. Concentrating the viewer's attention, I hope, on the small white cottage dwarfed by the landscape around it and the dark sky above. Composition, of course, is one of the things that we have to master to create an effective photograph. When we start out, we have to learn how to, how to organize the elements in a frame in, the, in an attractive way, how to take the viewer on a journey around the image and also how to recreate the 3D world in a 2D photograph. But of course, with landscape photography, we soon find out we don't live in a perfect world, and sometimes we have to accept things as they are, not perhaps as we'd like them to be. So this photograph was taken in the rice fields in Bali, and I wanted to capture the sweeping lines of the rice fields, the rice terraces in front of me. I composed to put the line of trees on the top right uh, and counterbalanced by this small structure, this small hut over on the, on the left hand side. Ideally, I would have liked to have got the full sweep here on this side, uh, but uh, I couldn't go any wider. There was something in this part of the scene that crept into the frame that I didn't like it. It was just a bit jarring to the eye. Um, and um, no matter what I did, move left, right, up or down, I would resolve one problem and, um, and then create another, which is fairly typical. Um, so sometimes when we're photographing the landscape, we have to accept what I call the least damaging compromise. So I ask myself, you know, which of these things that are annoying me about the composition am I most prepared to live with? And if there's one that I can live with, and by live with, I mean, if that was a print on my wall, could I look at it every day without it irritating the hell out of me? Um, then I will accept that compromise and I will take the photograph. If I can't find one that's acceptable to me, I'll walk away. But there are occasions when everything comes together, the weather and light cooperates, a composition hangs together without any compromises, and the gods of luck smile down on me. Um, and this photograph is a, an example of that. It was taken in Scotland uh, on Rannoch Moor. I had spent some time wandering along the edge of this particular loch and looking for a composition. It was taken in November. Um, light was fading fairly fast on me. Um, but I found this composition of these stepping stones, I call them, zigzagging through the frame. Eventually, taking you to this tree, which very conveniently bends and points like a finger towards my focal point, which is the mountain in the distance. Sun was setting or going down over here. Um, and I really wanted some light in the scene, and it was pretty flat and grey and miserable when I, I first spotted the, the composition. So I set the camera up, um, and, uh, and I waited uh, and waited and waited, <laughs> and eventually I, I was about to give up. I'd taken the camera off the tripod and put the camera back in the bag. But one of the things I do as a habit is I never, the last thing I take down is the tripod. Um, Fortunately, I was putting stuff away. I turned around. I saw the light just kissing the mountain over here. And, um, and I thought, wow, there's my shot. I threw everything back together, camera lens back on the tripod, filters in place. And I got a couple of frames, probably two or three frames um, before it all disappeared again. 
Uh, the need for the compositional uh, precision that I've just described is one of the many reasons why I use a tripod, uh, and in particular a tripod with a geared head. Uh, my uh, heads of choice are an Arca Swiss Cube or an Arca Swiss D4 head. Manfrotto also make a geared head that I've used in the past, but they enable you to be very precise in fine-tuning the details of a composition. I often refer to what I call the three P's of landscape photography, planning, patience, and persistence. Uh, this is a location not far from where I live, probably a 40 minute drive, that I visited many times over the years, and it was a long while before I made an image that I was happy with, several wasted journeys. Either the weather didn't cooperate or I just failed to capture the drama and the mood of the location. So persistence played its part, I had to keep going back until I got the image that you see here, but so did patience. For I set my camera up to give the composition that I was after. So all of these lines taking you in towards the tree, which is my focal point, this tree that hangs on rather precariously uh, onto the rock face and this, um, this face shape in the rock so that that really is my key area of the composition and all the lines are hopefully taking you towards that that focal point but i had to um, set the camera up and then wait for some time for cloud cover to move in and create the light that i wanted as well as give me some detail in the sky when i first arrived that sky that you see there was pretty gray flat boring um, but I could see some cloud was moving in so I waited for that to, to happen my view is if a shot's worthwhile taking then it's worthwhile waiting for and so I'll frequently frequently stand around for two or three hours to get the light and the weather conditions that I'm after this photograph was taken close to my home it's another from the local woods that I showed you before where I often walk my dog it's located about a 15 minute walk from home, somewhere I'm becoming very familiar with in the time of lockdown. Um, does the fact that it's close to home undermine its value as a photograph? My view is, of course not. The strength of a photograph rests with the final image. The viewer looks at the image and they either like it or they don't. They don't care whether the photographer nearly died to get the shot, whether they had a foot amputated due to frostbite as a result of getting the shot, or if it's the favourite image of the photographer's mother, which of course it wouldn't be because this is black and white. Um, they view it for what it is. It's a photograph. Ansel Adams' photograph, uh, Moonrise over Hernandez, a very well-known landscape um, image, he did no more than climb onto the roof of his station wagon, erected his tripod to get the photograph. It doesn't undermine its value as a fantastic image, though. This photograph was taken at dawn on a cold, snowy morning on the South Island in New Zealand. We stood overlooking the Remarkables, these mountains in the distance here, as snow showers came and went. Occasionally the sun broke through and we had some lovely directional light that brought out the shapes of the landscape as you see in the valley below me. I love to try and work in these conditions. That's why I love places like New Zealand, like Scotland or the Faroe Islands where this photograph was made, places where the weather is constantly changing. For I have a saying that if I haven't got wet then I probably haven't got a good photograph. Uh, and what that means is I don't take photographs stood out in the rain very often, but I'm usually working on the edge of a weather system, as you can see here, with rain moving in or rain moving away. So I either get wet while I'm waiting for the image or just after I've taken it. Um, but these conditions can create uh, really atmospheric photographs with dramatic light. And another saying frequently applied to landscape photography is, if you've seen it, you've missed it. Um, put all this together, and it usually means setting up the camera and hunkering down, doing your best to protect spirits and camera, waiting for all the elements to cooperate. But there isn't one approach that will guarantee success. If only it was that easy. Uh, sometimes you have to stay alert for a potential photograph and quickly make the most of an opportunity where it occurs. This is another photograph from New Zealand 
taken on the road to Milford Sound. I was driving a workshop group in a van down the road and we had experienced all four seasons in one day sunshine heavy rain snowfalls and but some magical light for this shot i saw the rain moving towards us down the valley i stopped jumped out the van with everyone else i set up my tripod and camera and i just had time to take three or four photographs and then the storm reached us it's another shot that i think is fairly typical of my style the emphasis is on mood and drama more than detail. The composition, again, is pretty minimalist. And it's confirmation of the, if I haven't got wet, then I probably haven't got a good photograph mantra. I've shown you a range of photographs taken from across the world, from Iceland and the Faroe Islands to Antarctica, Australia, New Zealand, the USA and Italy. But in doing so, I haven't wanted to minimise the importance of photographs that can be found on your doorstep. I've already shown you photographs taken in my local woods. This photograph was taken even closer to home, about five minutes from where I live. Uh, it wasn't a planned shot, it was taken one November evening whilst I was out walking my dog. But it's won awards in competitions, it's been used by Olympus at Photokina, and it's sold a few times as a print. The location is absolutely irrelevant to its success, it's the mood that it conveys that makes it work. As American photographer Saul Leiter once said, it is not where it is or what it is that matters, but how you see it. Having said that, now back to the other side of the world. Um, this was taken again on the workshop down in South Georgia and Antarctica back in 2016. And this trip took me to some of the most magical places I've ever been to in my life. And I love the landscapes. And surprisingly for me, I also enjoyed the wildlife we encountered there. The penguins in particular were fascinating to observe and to photograph. <coughs> Excuse me, take a sip of water. I used to say, if it breathes, I don't photograph it. <laughs> but sometimes it's good to work out of your comfort zone. And um, this particular image uh, was taken early one morning. The workshop group were happily working away and um, I spotted these three penguins. So I got down low with a 7 to 14 mil lens and got them as they walked towards me. They're quite inquisitive creatures who don't feel threatened by humans generally. And so they were walking towards me. The important thing for me is one, I was trying to ensure, so I'm moving left and right to ensure that these uh, male elephant seals tussling in the background were um, were distinct from the penguins in the foreground. Um, and, I, and I just, I was so lucky that both these penguins looked this way along this line of low cloud um, hanging uh, in the uh, in the landscape uh, and looking at this image I'm reminded of the quote that uh, my wife has in her office which is nothing at all to do with photography but it says if you always do what you've always done you'll always get what you've always got I think it's good for our creativity to push boundaries and to try something different from time to time so occasionally I'll shoot in color uh, this photograph was taken on the Faroe Islands as a storm rolled in off the North Atlantic. I wanted to capture the drama, the energy, the dynamism of the landscape as I was feeling it at the time. I fitted a, an ND filter to give me a long exposure and to record the windblown clouds scudding across the sky, blowing towards me. I was lucky to get a break in the clouds here above the island of Kultur, which is what you see here. And uh, it adds a welcome highlight uh, to the sky as well, in, well as giving me a patch of light in the water here. I was also lucky that uh, I got some light on the foreground uh, next to me as I was taking the shot because it, it emphasizes a sense of, uh, of depth in the, in the scene. It's an example of my belief, as I said earlier, that behind every photograph there should be a concept, an idea, a thought or emotion, that there should be something we're trying to communicate to the viewer beyond this scene or subject is attractive and I like it. This is a photo of Detifoss, the waterfall in Iceland, taken late one evening as the light was falling. In fact, you can see the rising moon over here in the image. I got as close, uh, well, it was, I ought to say, it was impossible not to be moved by the drama of this scene. The water 
uh, crashing down the, the, the waterfall, the spray flying up and the, just the noise of it all. I got as close to the edge as I could. I'm not a great lover of heights. Um, and, and I tried to get the base of the falls in the shot and the spray billowing, billowing up into the air. Through my image, I've tried to give the viewer a feeling of the grandeur of the landscape and the noise and the power of the water as it crashed over the falls. You tell me whether that image conveys that for you or not. We'll come on to that in a minute. Um, so I'm looking to close the presentation and move on to the uh, question and answer session. Hopefully this presentation has given you a feel for the principles that influence me and the approach that underpins the photographs I take. I also hope that what I've said and the quotations I've used have been thought provoking and may even influence your approach to photography. I want to leave you with one final quote to reflect on. Um, I think photographers, and I know I'm guilty of this, so perhaps I oughtn't to tar everyone with the same brush, but photographers can be quite guilty of procrastination. You know, we're always going to go to location X or Y to get photographs next week, next month, next year, or we're always going to complete that project that we started three years ago, or we're always going to end up uh, organizing an exhibition that never actually happens. I'm sure, you know, you've been there. These, these things are uh, familiar to you. So I'm going to share with you a quote again from Brooks Jensen and his book, Letting Go of the Camera. Maybe, he said, the great lesson that is presented to us every day is that there will never be time for photography, but there's always time for life. When we find a way to make photography fit our life, we'll have time for photography. Perhaps we'd best learn this before our time for life runs out. Don't want that to be depressing, but hopefully it's motivating. <laughs> um, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Uh, if you'd like to stay in touch, find out more about my workshops or find out about publications or, um, or forthcoming exhibitions or talks and so on, you can sign up for my newsletter via my website, um, the contacts page on my website and the website address is there at the bottom of that image. So enough for me. Thanks for listening. And I'm happy to take questions. I'll just uh, sort the technology out and turn my video back on. So unfortunately for you, you'll have to see me again. Well, that was just um, an enthralling uh, presentation, Steve. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, you gave us a great deal to think about. Um, I've made some notes here and I, I'm just going to read them out just very quickly. Um, the, the points I think which struck me and perhaps struck many other people. Um, shoot for yourself and believe in yourself. I think that, that, that came across very, very clearly. Um, try and develop your own sense of um, photographic value, I suppose. Um, um, a lot of people have asked and, and we'll come to this in the questions uh, if you visualize in mono and whether you may even set the camera up in, uh, to view in mono. No need to answer that now. Um, uh, right at the beginning, you said don't get obsessed with technical perfection. I think this is so important. I, I, I personally feel that we might get a little bit distracted by technical perfection at the expense of creativity. Um, what what I think came across from you, from you is very much that um, it's the picture that matters above all. Yeah. Um, and um, I think there are a few questions about long exposure uh, and and blurring, uh, which I, I think you'll uh, be asked about. And people are very interested to know about uh, how you process. Um, um, there was a question about tripods, which I, I don't know whether you saw in the chat, but the, you, you, you then answered that very, very quickly. <laughs> oh, right. Now, I couldn't. When I'm sharing my screen, I can't see the chat. So I have no idea about the questions that are coming in. So, yeah, I'm, 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 a, I'm a very simple man. I can only concentrate on the presentation. I couldn't read the questions at the same time. I'd get terribly confused if I tried that. Well, that, that, that was very spooky in, in, in that case, because um, um, uh, obviously, Olympus is famous for its um, stability, uh, its built-in stabilizing technology, but um, um, landscape photographers, many of them still swear by the tripod, and I, I can see that, that, that 
you obviously depend on 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 a tripod i think it helps with composition as well doesn't it yeah uh, i i often say to people that it doesn't matter to me whether i'm shooting with a you know an image stabilized camera and lens or whether i'm shooting at two thousandth of a second uh, i will still use a tripod okay because, uh, uh, shall i just explain sure just i was just going to say to say why um the prime reason is it forces me to slow down. It forces me to consider what I'm doing. There's no such thing when you're using a tripod. There's no such thing really as a quick snap. And the problem is if we just do the quick snap, um, we're not thinking through what it is we're really trying to do. And we're not being precise about the, about the composition. So I can set the camera up um, on top of a tripod i can look all around the outside of the viewfinder i can you know make sure that there aren't lines going through the composition that actually disrupt the flow of the image i can make sure there aren't things creeping in to the edges that shouldn't be in there it's very difficult to do that when we're shooting handheld the is system on the olympus cameras is excellent i had a guy an american guy who came on a workshop on sky a few years ago and um and he didn't really want to bring a tripod, but he brought one because we had said to him, bring a tripod, you'll need one in Scotland. And um, he brought the flimsiest thing I've ever seen, which I spent, you know, a couple of days taking the mickey out of him about. Um, and I think it was the third day he fell over. He was fortunately OK, but his tripod wasn't. It, the legs had just snapped off. But he got some incredible images using an EM1 Mark II and a 12 to 100 mil lens. Um, sometimes shooting two, three seconds and getting some fantastic photographs. So it is possible, but I just prefer the discipline of, of having a tripod. Okay, that, that's great insight. Um, just before we go to questions that were posted during your presentation, uh, there are a few from the forum that were uh, posted before the start. And uh, as people took the trouble, I think I'm going to start off there. Um, so. Uh, Mark Farrington, I think. I, I think you've got a few questions here. So you asked, Mark, do you, do you want to ask your question about Capture One, um, or shall I read it out? Is Mark there? You need to turn your microphone on. Hi, Steve. Hi, Mark. Yeah, great talk. Um, I, I'm pretty sure you use Capture One, and I wonder if you could give us a little bit more uh, detail on your workflow, particularly with the latest version of it, which perhaps you're using, and 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 your mo your monochrome images. Okay, uh, I haven't used the most recent version. I just haven't had time to uh, to download it yet. Um, surprisingly, in this time of lockdown, uh, I'm, I've been almost as busy as as ever. Um, but um, so I haven't had time to use the latest version. But generally, I've been using Capture One. Oh, many, many years. I think we're on version 20 now and I started using it on version 3. So it gives you some idea of, uh, of how long I've been using it. Um, what I do is I will do basic um, processing. So I will change the contrast. I will um, uh, lighten and darken areas using broad areas using uh, capture one so i'll get the image as close to finished as possible um, then i will export it to photoshop um, and then i will do selective dodging and burning now capture one has got much better in recent iterations for doing localized dodging and burning work and and also the the um, introduction of layers to capture one a few versions ago has has helped that that process uh, but it's very much the sort of detail work that i will do in photoshop i used to do my um my cloning so taking out dust spots and so on in photoshop but the most recent version of capture one i think might solve that particular problem um, and then occasionally i'll use silver effects pro within photoshop to uh, to do my black and white conversion so either i'll do the black and white conversion in capture one and then export it to um, to, to Photoshop to do the detail work, or um, I'll get it as close as I can to, to finished, but as a color image, then into Photoshop, do the detail work, then do the silver effects, black and white conversion. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank, 
Thank you, Mark. Uh, Paul Graeber um, has already done a couple of presentations to us. Uh, he, he's one of our members. He's also a, a, a club um, judge. Um, he has done some, a couple of presentations to us already on black and white. I think he's converted a few people who weren't that bothered about black and white. But uh, so he's obviously uh, <laughs> he, does, very he doesn't want to meet my mum, does he? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm going to ask Paul. So I think you're still there. If you want to turn your microphone on, um, you had a question about um, um, the process of deciding if a picture should be mono. Yeah. I, I, it, can you hear me? Okay. No. Yes, I can hear you, Paul. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm not keen to meet your mother after what I've heard, but <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I, my question, and I can see several other people have asked a very similar question, which is about your thought process. Are you thinking mono when you're setting up to make a photo, or is it something when you look at it later on on your computer screen, are you then saying, actually, I think that one would work in black and white, or is it the case that because about 95% of what you do ends up as mono anyway, the thought process is almost automatic yeah good question um i um i usually well i see the world by default in black and white so i ought to say that you know i was brought up shooting black and white film um and i've shot black and white you know since i was about seven so as you can see about you know 10 years now uh-huh um <laughs> but um I see the world in black and white, so it's almost like color is is a is a conscious deviation from from my norm. So when I'm looking through the viewfinder, I'm seeing the image as the finished black and white print usually. So I'm, I'm even thinking about you know I can lighten that area, or I can darken that area, um, I can change the tonal relationships between that and that. So all of that is going through my head even as I'm looking through the camera. Um, Usually the criteria I'm, I'm, that underpins what I do is, um, does colour add anything to this photograph? And if the answer is no, it, it doesn't have to be a colour photograph, it, all, it can be black and white. Um, I don't have the camera set to show me black and white. I do say to people who come on workshops, if, if you're not used to seeing the world in black and white, then set the camera to show you black and white uh, when you look through the viewfinder or on the screen on the back. And if you're shooting RAW and JPEG and you find that you've made a mistake later on, you can always go back to the, to the color RAW file anyway. So you don't actually lose anything, but it helps you to start seeing the world in, in black and white. Um, interestingly, a few years ago, um, phase one lent me uh, their achromatic back so it only shoots in black and white you can't shoot a color file wow i found that really disconcerting i had to go back to the days of shooting black and white films so i had to think about do i need a red filter or an orange filter or a yellow filter or a blue filter to change the tonal relationships i've just got so used to taking a color raw file and thinking i can do that to the red channel i can do that to the green channel um so um yeah thinking in black and white is very much um it sort of it just runs through the bloodstream now it's not something i have to consciously think about too much so you're you're definitely in the camp that uh, believes that color helps black and white um because leica for example have put a lot of effort into producing uh the monochrome yeah which is like the phase one achromatic yeah. it only yeah, it only shoots a black and white image yeah so you it, it's a different way of thinking um you know i had to say i had to go back when i was using it and it would be the same with the leica monochrome i'd have to go back to um i had to go back with the phase one back of thinking about the tonal relationships and how i can change them at the taking stage rather than how i can change them at the processing stage and in some ways, that sort of having to worry about it at the taking stage gets in the way of the image making process for me. Okay, that's great. Um, um, we've got a question here from the forum. Um, um, it's, it's more about the gear. So with so many people and professionals migrating across to mirrorless full frame, um, as a pro, what keeps you uh, using Olympus and Micro Four Thirds? And uh, in a world of 
full frame, does he still think Mike for four thirds has a future? That's a tough question. Um, well, I'd like to think so. I've got a lot of money invested like everyone else in this group. I'm sure a lot of money invested in it. Um, I, um, I can produce, you know, 30 inch by 20 inch images from a, from a micro four thirds file. I rarely print any bigger than that. Um, so that's the first thing, you know, I get people who come on workshops or are shooting with Canon or Nikon and they'll say, um, well, why do you shoot with this small sensor? And I ask, so how print, how large do you normally print? And usually the answer is, oh, no bigger than A3 plus. Well, you know, as we all know, micro four thirds can easily print to that size and, and beyond. I'm frequently printing at A2 plus. Um, so I don't have a, a concern from that point of view. I guess the, the advantages, particularly of the Olympus system for me, are um, image stabilization when I need it. So when I was in Antarctica and South Georgia, I didn't take a tripod. It was very strict weight restrictions. Um, so you know, I didn't take a tripod. Most of the photography is done from a Zodiac, so a little rubber boat or from the ship. So hand holding is, uh, is the order of the, of the day. Uh, I went to Botswana last year. I was photographing wildlife from the back of a, of a truck. Um, again, you know, tripods were, would have been no use to me at all. So there's that element. The other thing, of course, is the weather ceiling. I happily took the Olympus kit down to Antarctica, South Georgia, and, and to Greenland last year. And I didn't have to worry about snow, rain, sea spray. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a sealed system and um, ideal for that. I, I mean, I also use a, a, a phase one medium format system, and I find they're a good um, counterbalance to each other. Um, the Olympus is weather sealed. It's got image stabilization, so I can shoot with it handheld when I need to in circumstances I've just described. Um, and I've got a range of lenses, you know, from everything from, you know, the 7 to 14 mil up to the 300 mil prime lens. Uh, I just couldn't get that range of lenses for the phase one system that I shoot with. You know, undoubtedly, the bigger the sensor, um, the... Um, the better sort of tonal range that you can get and also the dynamic range um, and also the micro detail. I mean, if I was to blow a phase one image up on my screen at 100% and you can look at the micro detail, absolutely amazing. But then, you know, you're talking about a system that costs several thousands of pounds, um, a lot more than the Olympus system. And ultimately, as I said in the talk, you know, technical perfection is not the be-all and end-all of everything. Um, it's about conveying some mood and emotion. And uh, the image doesn't have to be, you know, technically perfect. So you can look at it at 100% on the screen and see the hairs on a, you know, on a gnat's leg. That's not important to me. Okay. I think that covers that well. I, I, I mean, uh, one, one point that I'd make is that... Um, Full frame mirrorless, they can make small bodies, but the lenses are still going to be big and heavy. Yeah. Um, and in fact, modern optics has made some of the lenses even bigger and bigger and heavier than the um, their predecessors. Um, and um, if you don't want to carry all that gear around, then you're not going to take great photos with them. Um, that's right. I mean, that that's the you know that's the that's the other issue. If you're if you're humping heavy kit. Uh, particularly in the landscape that can that can just get in the way of the creative process because you become more concerned about the about carrying the weight on your back than about how you're going to use it when you find the when you find the photograph uh, and i'm finding as somebody who travels as you've seen overseas a lot well did until um covid19 um just flying these days with camera kit is such a difficult process and the restrictions are getting tighter and tighter uh, when i went to australia and new zealand back in 2018 i think our weight limit was seven kilograms for carry-on there's um, there's no, there's no way i could get a bigger system than the olympus system for seven kilograms and get the range of lenses that i wanted to take um what, one thing which has emerged um from discussions before the the um uh, today's event and also in, in the chat is that 
um, you have a particular in, um, likeness for the um, 12 to 100 um, and several people have been inspired by your choice as well uh, so uh, Olympus can be very thankful for that um, <laughs> What is it? What is it about that that lens that makes it special for you? Um, I guess the flexibility, you know, to have everything from twenty four to thinking thirty five mil focal length terms from twenty four to to two hundred mil in one lens with superb optical quality. Uh, I I first got that lens when I went to Antarctica, and so I went in November. Um, and the camera was not due out in the shops. The camera, the M1 Mark II, and the lens, the 12 to 100, were not due in the shops until after Christmas. And I went in November, and I had a um, version of that um, lens and camera with me. And I, I was a bit, you know, twitchy about it's new. I haven't had a lot of experience of it, but I have to say, incredibly sharp. I was really impressed by the the sharpness and of course it's weather sealed um, so one of the things you don't want to be doing in those sorts of environments is changing lenses frequently so um, just just in terms of one do-it-all lens from as I demonstrated in the talk from you know, broad landscapes to close-up detail work um, it's it's a sort of Swiss army knife of landscape photography really I mean, right. you know, obviously, I've got access to, to the zooms and the primes. But if I was pushed into a corner and told you can only take one lens, it would be the 12 to 100. OK, great. Um, Bill Dennis, um, do, you want, do you want to un, unmute your mic? Um, you had a question about um, art filters. Hi, Steve. Hi, um, Bill. Really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, yes, Thank you. when you use the art, when you use the art filters, I like the through the windscreen shots. Um, do you post process those at all, or do you just do minimal cropping and things like that? Um, no, I do some post processing to them. Um, not not a great deal because you tend to find you don't you don't want you know, if you've used the art filter and you've shot through a wet windscreen of a car um, and you've shot at high ISO so that the noise reduction smudges the detail, um, you know, what 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 else can you do in post processing? But I will play around with um, overall contrast and I will lighten and darken uh, particular areas if I think they're distracting from the overall feel of the of the image. But I to be honest, generally with um, photography, whether it's art filters or not, whether it's with a phase one or an Olympus, um, I want to keep the processing to a, to a minimum. I'm a lazy computer operator, so I still use neutral density graduated filters. Um, I've got an American friend, uh, Kevin Raber, who runs the Photo PXL website, and he and I run workshops together. And for years, you know, he'll he'll say, "What is it with you Brits? You know, why is it you still use graduated filters? You can just merge these, take two exposures, and merge them in post processing." And I said, "Well, you know, I've got the filters. I know how to use them, and I'd rather spend the time out here in the landscape than spend ages faffing around on the computer trying to blend things together that's me you know that's my i'm not knocking people who do that far from it uh, i admire their skill but it's that doesn't work for me i try to keep the time in front of the computer to a minimum and so if i can get a what i call an exhibition quality print so something you know i could make a huge print of and not worry about you know the details of it um if i can get that in a couple of hours fantastic if i get it in 45 minutes even better but you know some sometimes it's quick sometimes i'll take two or three days faffing around with a with an image until i get it feeling right for me okay thank, thank you, you. Um, David Travis uh, wanted to follow on from Bill's um, question in, 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 the, in the chat. Is, is David there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Hi, David. Would you uh, like to follow up? I think Steve answered the question, actually, anyway. I just wanted you to check. I, I, was, I guess at first I was thinking that perhaps you only shot JPEG and you didn't shoot RAW. Uh, clearly, you obviously do shoot RAW. But I guess the question is more to do with post-processing. So when you... Um, so that, that those, although the Olympus art filters can be quite, well, you could say quite heavy handed, I guess. Yeah. Um, I wonder if, if when you're doing your own post-processing, if you try and kind of emulate the art filter or if there's some 
kind of destination you have in mind when you're post-processing? Kind of what's your thought process behind that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't use the art filters very much. I only use them when I know I'm looking for a specific result, like the shot through the wet windscreen of the car. Um, sometimes um, the art filters can be, and I've, I've used this with people on workshops, they can be good fun to give you a, a feel for what the image could look like. But to be honest, even my recommendation to people is even if you use the art filter when you're taking the image, my preference is usually to go to the raw file and try and make it look a little bit like the, the art filters. Because as you say, the art filters, unless you're going for a fairly extreme look, can can look a bit overcooked. So I, I like to sort of use the art filter as a, this is an aim uh, of somewhere I could go towards, but I don't want to go the whole destination. So I'll take the raw, raw file and then process it to a point where I feel enough is enough. I don't, I don't want to go over the top with things unless that's a, you know, a, a creative choice to do that. Okay. Um, Francesca, are you still here? Um, you had a question about cropping. No. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll read Francesca's question out uh, and unless you need to unmute your mic. Um, I'll read it out. Um, do you take your picture with the square crop or do you use the four thirds view? Question mark. Huh. Um, uh, I guess the answer to that is yes. Um, <laughs> I, um, I've shot square format for a number of years. So I, I tend a bit like I see the world in black and white. I, I can see the world. I can pre visualize it as a square crop. Um, so, um, I, I usually, I'm usually shooting in the four, three ratio and I can, and I will pre visualize the, the crop and do it later. Um, having said that there are times like the photographs that I showed you from New York where it was a, it was a, a, a week away with my wife in New York. Um, obviously photography an integral part of that. And I decided to, um, in creative terms, <clears throat> tie my hands behind my back. So I decided I took two pen Fs and uh, one had a 17 mil lens fitted, the other one had a 45 mil, and I took a 12 mil F2 with me in the bag, which never got used. So I restricted the kit I took, didn't take any zoom lenses. And I also predetermined that I was going to shoot everything in square format. Why did I do that? Just to keep things simple, um, to, to impose some discipline some you know, creative equivalent of a hair shirt if you like to to impose some discipline on me to force me to look at the world in a particular way now sometimes i'll do that it's a bit like the equivalent of i'm going to go out for the day with one camera and one lens you know one prime lens and whatever i find is what i find it just makes you um, think and work a little bit harder and i find by keeping things simple that sort of freeze my creativity to not worry about the kit and I'm worrying more about the the final image but generally unless I'm doing something like that you know it's, it's deliberately imposing a discipline on me then I'll shoot in 4.3 and subsequently crop it. Um, I, I used to shoot um, almost exclusively square and then somebody on a workshop which was a good challenge somebody said to me next time I come on a workshop I want you to show me some images that are rectangular not square it, it's a challenge he said you've been challenging us all week I want to challenge you to start taking rectangular images and so I do um, you know I thought that was a fair challenge and it's a bit like when somebody says to me oh yeah you're that black and white guy I will deliberately go out and shoot color photographs just to prove to me, if you like, that I can, not to prove to the, that individual, but just to prove to me that, that, um, that I can do it. I don't like being pigeonholed and I don't like, um, I don't like feeling that I'm in a creative rut. You remember that quote I shared with you in the talk, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And the danger is photographically that we end up taking photographs of our photographs, which I don't want to do. That's a very good point. Um, of course, square format's great for Instagram, and you've got, an, you've got a great Instagram feed, so I do encourage everyone to go and have a look at Steve Gosling on Instagram. Thank you. Um, okay, so Jeremy, it's your turn. Oh, no, he's on the phone. 
<laughs> I'll come back to Jeremy. Okay. Um, I know he's come. He's back. Jeremy, are, are you free? Yes, I am. Thank, thank you very much, Steve. Um, I did notice that during that uh, uh, fantastic uh, uh, piece you gave us, you were talking a little bit occasionally about the story behind your photos. And I always find that I often miss the story, either in my own or in others. So I wondered how you managed to get the story to come through when there's no uh, sort of activity or people or things you might normally associate with a story. How, how does a static picture get a story? Um, well, I guess the first thing is, you know, that process I described of, so what is it that's, what, why am I looking at this scene thinking there's a photograph here? And, and what is that photograph about? Um, and then it, it really, it's experience, which is where I guess I can help people in, the, in a workshop sense. It's experience about, okay, so if that's what I'm wanting to communicate, how do I best do that? through my image and that could be the use of filters long exposures for instance it could be composition um it can be a whole range of different techniques that you use but the important thing is to be clear about what it is you're trying to say before you fire the shutter and to give you a sort of anecdotal um story to support that um there was a lady who came on the workshop i was instructor on in greenland back in uh, august september last year and um, it's a she's a lady I know, so I could perhaps afford to be a little more um, uh, blunt with her than uh, I would be normally. Uh, and I would keep saying to her, Sue, so why you, what is it about this photograph that's appealing to you? What is it about this scene? And she kept saying to me, it's pretty. And I said, you can't photograph pretty. And she said, yeah, but it's pretty. And I said, yeah, it might be pretty. But if you can't define what makes it pretty to you, how can you photograph it? Is it the colors? Is it the shapes? Is it the light? What, what is it that makes it pretty, i.e. attractive to you? Um, and often what I find is that people don't clarify the reasons they're taking a photograph to themselves. And then when they see the final image, it sort of fails because it, it's, again, what I said in the talk about if you're not clear about why you're taking a photograph, it's almost down to chance as to whether that image conveys what you're trying to say or not. Um, again, to give you a sort of specific, um, there's a, I didn't show this image in the talk, but there's a photograph that I've got of a lone tree uh, with a huge sky above it. And I've deliberately put the tree very small at the bottom of the frame. The reason I did that was when I was looking at this scene, I just felt overwhelmed by the sky, I, the, these huge clouds. And I felt like I was a speck on the surface of the planet. I just felt like an ant underneath this huge sky. So I used the tree as a metaphor for me and the way I was feeling. So I put the tree very small in the frame, overwhelmed by the sky, and I put it at the bottom of the frame so it looked like the sky was trying to push it out of the image. Um, and so it's using techniques like that that I will try to convey the story behind the, the image. I don't know if that helps, Jeremy. Um, thank you. Yes, it, it, it's obviously it's me. I can't convert my feelings into composition. Thank you. Okay, well, and that's that's a process that that um, gets better through experience. But don't give up on it. It's it's like everything else, you know. When we try something new, um, it's almost easier to go back to how it used to be. I mean, when I was in my twenties, I used to play a lot of squash. And then I would try and master a new stroke, normally my backhand. Um, and I'd concentrate so hard on mastering the backhand that the rest of my game would fall apart. And the temptation was to just say, oh, sod it. I'll just go back to playing the backhand at how I've always played it, i.e. I would never improve. And the same photographically, when you're starting to concentrate on doing something differently, what I find is that you... You, you, the, the rest of your photographic skills fall apart. But if you just stick to it, keep working at it, eventually it all comes together like a complete jigsaw. Thank you. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Uh, James, uh, Jima, you had a question about printers. Right, you need to unmute. You need to unmute, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't work unless I've got my second screen active. Okay. Sorry about that, Steve. <laughs> That's all right. I can't, I can't lip read, James. Otherwise, <laughs> we'd have been okay. 
<laughs> okay, kidding. Um, printers are a, a thing on my mind at the moment because mine are busy sort of dying after many years' use, and I'm trying to actually figure out what whether to try and resurrect them or replace them or whatever. I just wondered because with the last two monochrome sessions and your uh, propensity for monochrome landscapes, um, if there's a particular printers that lend themselves especially to monochrome printing? Um, hard for me to answer that. I think in that I've only ever used Epson printers. Um, why? Because you remember I said I'm a lazy computer operator. I know how they work. I know how to set them up and so on. Um, I've I've used a range of Epson printers over the years. I use the Epson inks. I don't buy other manufacturers' inks. Um, and I find that they give me the black and white images that I I like. Uh, I mean, it's the papers, actually, that will, will have a bigger influence on the look of the final print. So I tend to use um, Permajet papers. I use their Permajet Museum Classic, which is a matte, fine art, slightly textured paper for black and white primarily. And they have an image, and it's called Gold Silk, that I use for, for, for colour work. Uh, but generally, um, I, my advice is stick stick with a printer or, you know, pick a printer, stick with it, find out its foibles to get the best out of it. But of course, importantly, um, make sure that your screen is calibrated and what you're printing is giving you what you're seeing on the on the screen. Yeah, good answer. Thank you for that, sir. OK, just a couple more questions then, um, because we've been on a very long time. Um, um, Linda Marshall uh, asked me to read this question out, uh, and it's printers, printing again. What's the largest you have printed from a high-res file on your Olympus? <laughs> right, okay. Uh, well, here's a confession. I, um, I've only ever used the high-res mode to, um, to try it out um, or to demonstrate things in workshops. Um, what I found is, and, and Aidan Bain from Olympus tells me that actually it's improved with later iterations and I've yet to try that out for myself. But when they first put the high res mode in the M5 um, Mark II, I think it was, um, I, I, I was told, oh, you know, it's a fantastic, you need to have it on a tripod, it will be amazing for landscapes. And what I found is if I'm doing long exposures and anything's moving, clouds or water particularly, I, I was up in the Lake District doing some test shots and I was photographing a jetty using a long exposure and smoothing the water. And what I found was I was getting these herringbone type pattern artifact, artifacts in the water. Um, and so I stopped using it um, on the basis that you know, I couldn't see um, those artifacts on the screen, on the camera screen, so I could only see them when I got home. And I thought, I really don't want to be in the position where I've taken a photograph of a lifetime to get home and find that I've got herringbone artifacts in the final image. So I just stopped using it. But like I say, Aidan tells me that it's actually been improved in later iterations and you can get away with slightly longer exposures. And and I think you said earlier that you, you've you've had 30 inch prints done from your from from your cameras um I've, I've had 30 inch by 20 inch prints made um from actually from the original em5 and um and this was when i was evaluating you know could i move into this system um to do my professional work because i've been using pens for sort of personal work up to that point and the em5 came out and so this was a photograph tank with the em5 and the the old 12 to 50 kit zoom lens and a non-pro lens which you know people say is not fantastic image quality and i got 30 inch by 20 inch prints out of it that i'm i'm very happy but it was all tripod mounted you know it's using a cable release and all that stuff so max maximizing best technique to get the most out of the out of the camera that's great so um w one question for me is there one and this will be the last one um is there one overriding message that you have for people like us on a group like this, aspiring amateurs who who want to do something special with with, with their camera? What what's what's your overriding single piece of advice? When you say do something special with your camera, you mean produce some special images? Yeah, yeah. Is that you, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I just wanted to clarify in case you meant, you know, go swimming with a camera perched <laughs> on top of your head or something, you know. Um, 
Uh, so that's all right. My assumption was correct. Um, my my overriding piece of advice is, well, it's two things really that are connected. Follow your passions. You know, photo, photograph the things that interest you. Um, photograph the things that you have some emotional response to. You know, whether it's your kids, grandkids, your pet, the landscape, you know, whatever it happens to be. Phot photograph the things that move you and don't worry about what other people say about whether they're good photographs or whether you should or shouldn't be doing these these things um uh you know my my view is, as creative people and you know photographers are creative people we shouldn't be there shouldn't be any shoulds or shouldn'ts some of the things that um that have actually been quite productive for me in terms of producing work have been things that um, other people might consider to be a little weird, like the photographs through the wet windscreen of a car. I was with a friend of mine. We were in Sky. We were there for a week. It had absolutely chucked it down nearly every day while we were there. And I just grabbed the camera and said to him, look at that amazing scene through that wet windscreen. And he started to laugh. And he said, you're completely balmy. We've come all the way to Sky and you're photographing the landscape through a wet windscreen. And I said, what else are you going to do? It's absolutely bucketing down. Let's just give it a try. What have we got to lose? So, you know, he was saying you shouldn't be doing that. My answer was, why not? What have we got to lose? And actually, you know, within, well, after he'd sat there for about an hour while I'm getting really excited looking at images on the back of the camera, <laughs> he eventually grabbed his camera and started doing the same, the same thing. And we both got some very interesting photographs from from something that was a, a, perhaps a little weird or unusual. Well, that I think that was a brilliant uh, finale. Thank you very much, yeah. Steve. And um, Ian, but just to interrupt you, sorry, before you that's close, right. ju just just a quick advert, if I can. Of course. Sorry. Um, just to say that on Wednesday, I'm doing a, another webinar session like this for Olympus um, on urban abstracts. So it's about um, finding photographs closer to home in your local town or on your high street or even around your house. Um, trying to make interesting images out of the ordinary. And that's on Wednesday at, um, at six o'clock, so the 3rd of June. And there are still places available on that. People can sign up via the Olympus Image website. So um, hopefully I will see some of you again then. But um, I'll make yeah, sure that we, we provide a link on, on, on the site. Thank that. you. Um, uh, as Olympus uh, also publicise uh, our guest appearances with um, Olympus ambassadors. So, okay, thank you very much, um, and I hope that you there's still enough time to enjoy the the sunshine outside. In fact, there was one comment about this must be a horrible day. Uh, this must be the worst kind of weather for taking landscapes because you don't have the mood of the of the clouds and. Thanks. Exactly. That's why I've told my wife that I'm happy to cut the hedges this afternoon. So that's that's my job in the sunshine, cutting hedges. Fantastic. You don't want to keep this going for another three hours, do you? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, oh, everyone. Thank you. And I Stay hope you safe. enjoyed that. Um, and uh, I'll be uh, editing the video and uploading it to YouTube in the next few days. Uh, and uh, I'll send you a copy of the chat as well, Steve, because there's lots of Thank you comments lovely comments about uh, about your photography thank you very much everyone thank you everyone stay safe and well thank you for turning up enjoy your weekend thank you thank you cheers bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.